Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first session of Damon and Discord Anatomy of Dow, taught by Ross McL oh my God, sorry, Ross McElwin and Jay Springett. Uh, this is a two credit theoretical and practical seminar which will consider decentralized autonomous organizations from many angles, beginning with their science fiction influence prehistory before focusing on what DAOs are today, both technically and imaginatively. The seminar will result in speculative group pro projects to design and present future histories of fictional DAOs. Adopting Daniel Suarez's Damon, 2006, and Charles Strauss's Accelerando, 2005, as our starting points, we'll discuss the conceptual framework within which DAOs emerge, emphasizing that contemporary DAOs have been fashioned within only a limited range of all their possible modularities, and that DAOs could have taken and could yet take different paths of development. Stretching this notion to a speculative extreme, in the first sessions, we will consider future histories of hypothetical DAOs from the vantage of the year 2035. The seminar will then step back through time, examining both the principles and practices underpinning the DAOs of the present and the assumptions made about their past and futures. Presentations by participants in the first half of the seminar will include pitching ideas for DAOs to the group. Several of these will be chosen via quadratic voting process for further amplification in the second half, in which we will proceed to create detailed future archives of the chosen DAOs. These will be presented for critique by exer experts in the last session. The seminars with second module will take particular care to integrate, interrogate the dreams of decentralized and autonomy, decentralization and autonomy, or perhaps automation, by which theorists of DAOs have sometimes been beguiled. The speculative narrative of the group projects will allow the participants to explore these ideas to destruction without consequence. So Jay Springett is a consultant strategist and writer, currently specializing in the distributed web and world running. He creates cohesive worlds, hybrid environments made up of people, places, and technology. He is recognized as an articulate voice in the emerging speculative genre of solar punk and describes solar punk as a mimetic engine, a tool to power the refuturing of our collective imagination. He co-founded the decentralized creative exchange guild Exchange Guild.is, a member of the Global Red Regeneration Collab and a fellow of Royal Society of Arts. He co hosts the weekly podcast Permanently Moved.online. Ross McGalwain is a publisher and editor of Impossible at Impossible Object, a small press that uses Web3 tools to publish works of fiction, theory, conversation, and poetry. Impossible Objects Conversations on AI will feature dialogues on artificial intelligence between Reja Negarestani, Benjamin Bratton, Matt Dryhurst, Holly Herndon, Helen Hester, and Nick Smichek. Ross is also active in numerous DAOs within the wider Ethereum community. Apologies for my, my missteps, but um, I think you guys can take it away. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, let me just share my screen. There we are. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So welcome yeah. to Damon and Discord. And yeah, thanks very much for that intro, uh, Nick. Uh, those of you who follow Jay and me on Twitter will know how excited we've been about this course. Um, it's been quite a while in the making, um, a lot of thoughts gone into it. And we are very, very excited to get down to get down to business. Um, oh, what's going on there? Sorry, skipped a skipped a screen there. Just to introduce a couple of things about the course straight away. Um, so as Nick mentioned, just then this is a course that is going to be happening in two halves. Um, the first half for the next four weeks, then there'll be a bit of a break. And then the other half in November and December. These first four sessions are titled as follows and with the, uh, the guests that you can see there. So today is just Jay and I, um, and uh, we're doing two talks, but the overall title is The Weird Futures of DAOs. Session two 
will be with Ruth Catlow from Further Field Gallery and is entitled Blockchain 101 and 10 Years of Engagement. Session three is called DAO Tooling and DAOs Today with Kia Kreutler. So I've said her name wrong there, but she, could, she can correct me in her, uh, her session. Um, session four is Code is Law with Wasim El Sindi. And also in that session, we will have the DAO pitches from all of you and the quadratic vote to decide which ones to take forward to the second half of the seminar, which is where they will be very much amplified and fictionalized archives will be created for these DAO ideas that we hope are going to be weird, wild, weird, wild and wonderful. So yeah, very much looking forward to all of that. Uh, the running order for today is this. Um, I think we might be running, a, no, we're pretty much running on time. And um, we're gonna kick off with Jay's talk in a moment, uh, followed by mine. Then we will have a break and then there'll be time for group discussion afterwards. Uh, Jay and I timed our talks a little bit earlier. I think they're probably gonna run a little quicker than the timings that are on this, this screen here. So um, hopefully that'll mean there'll be a bit more time for group discussion at the end. Um, before we go on to Jay's talk, just quickly wanted to mention something that will be slightly different about this course, at least compared to other new center courses that I've audited in the past, um, which is that first off, there will not be text presentations um, in each session. Um, instead, or that component of the course will be replaced by each of you making a pitch for a DAO in session four. And these pitches will be approximately four minutes long. We'll get into the details of that a little bit later. And obviously we can discuss it uh, asynchronously in the Google Classroom and also in the New Center Discord if, um, if you desire. Um, the final work can be either an essay or a video lecture, which is the standard uh, piece of final assessment work for a, a single credit New Center course. Or if you feel like you've got the bit between your teeth by that point, you can produce a piece of speculative design relating to one of the DAO ideas, which has been pitched or discussed in the in the course. Again, we'll talk more about this later, but thought it was a good idea to mention this upfront. Okay, so Jay, if you're ready, we will go on to your talk now. Sure, um, let me just sort out my Brave browser, so I'm presenting. Bear with me one second. Hello, everyone. Um, I see you all. Um, where are we? Do I need to? If I full screen that, is that full screened in, in Zoom? Because I can't see Zoom now. Yes, I see nodding faces. Great. Um, So my screen sharing is paused, that's what it says. Can you still see my presentation? You can. And if I click next, and you can see that it's changed to me, my ridiculous selfie. No. Um, no, it's still weird pages. Bear with me one second. This is, I think I might have to. If you stop the share and then restart it, it might work. Uh, I'll do it this way. I'm sorry about the um, URL bar. Okay. Um, so that's me. Um, there's my blog and my newsletters there and my podcast. I'm on Twitter um, reluctantly. And also that's my Discord handle. Um, and I'm in the New Center Discord as well. So... This course hopefully will provide you with enough knowledge, context, cognitive tools um, to pitch and design your own DAOs of and from the future. Um, as Ross already mentioned, the final group projects are to present um, future histories of DAOs of your own design from the vantage point of 2035. And usually for the new center course, the cinema has a the this seminar has a design focus and it's less analytical and critical than sort of other events. Science fiction fueled the early ideas of DAOs, 
Um, and we can use the same tools, the same mental toolkits, and the same processes of world building to imagine their future histories. The future, of course, doesn't exist, but we can imagine it. My personal goal for this cinema, seminar um, is that I hope through collaborative discussion and the talks from our guest speakers, you will get a firm understanding of what DAOs once were, what in the context of the wider Web3 ecosystem they are today, and together we can explode open um, their future once again and what DAOs might be still. From 2035, 2022 is as far back as the invention of Bitcoin is today. This sort of exercise, considering the present through the telescope and mirror of the future, is one of the best ways of getting to know what is happening in the present. DAOs of today are making their first tentative steps into the real world. Headlines about DAOs raising money to buy a copy of the Constitution or, Jodos or Jodorowsky's June um, book uh, punctuated the mainstream news throughout last year and earlier this. Yet the fact that 5% of all cryptocurrency is currently held and managed by DAOs is missed. And it is a figure and a fact that is hard to explain in the day-to-day -day reporting in mainstream media. NFTs too, really a kind of file type, became one of the culture war issues during the course of the pandemic. The Web3 and wider ecosystem has amassed enough capital, both cultural and economic, 12 years after its invention, to have a kind of gravity. Richard Bartle, the inventor of MUDs, or multi-user dungeons, in the late 1970s, is the grandfather of all virtual worlds. And he said in 2003 that the virtual is that which isn't apparent, but having the form or effect of that which is. The gravity of cryptocurrencies or virtual currencies have in the present moment begun to bend and shape and influence the real world. None of the value created, none of the tools of Web3 is building is any sense capital R real, but we know that databases and ledgers have a huge impact on our daily lives and society. Blockchains, as they are developing, may eventually not even be quote unquote money. They may end up just being a source of value in the virtual. What DAOs and other tools like DeFi are experimenting with are essentially organizing value. It's not just blockchains that influence the real from their imaginary states, though, but databases of international finance, identity, social security, credit scores, major supermarket chains, international logistics, nation states, and governance, and more. And with the jet fuel development of AI also happening as we speak, it's clear that the construction, management, and ownership of databases is one of the defining aspects of modernity, which um, I'm sure James C. Scott, and you know, with his seeing like a state, seeing like a state would agree with. While it's not relevant to the ultimate goals of this course, we should for a moment consider the history of computing, looking backward from where we are today. In 1945. That was the year that ENIAC was first turned on. The invention of the solid trait state transistor at Bell Labs was in 1947. Kirby, uh, Kilby and Noyce's invention of the microchip was in 1959. In 1965, the IBM System 360 project delivered for the first time multiple computing machines that could run all the same code. So it was like right once, run everywhere for the first time. In, 19, in 1969, we went to the moon with read-only code stored in braids of rope. In 1972, microchips were cheap enough to find their way into a curious arcade cabinet called Pong. In 1979, the first virtual world was connected to the proto-internet. Oh, I forgot to put that on the slide. 1983, Nintendo launched the NES and St. Stallman was banging the drum for free and open source software. 1993 brought the Intel, the Intel Pentium chip and 2008, we got the iPhone the same year as the Bitcoin network was first turned on. What has changed since 2008? Well, a lot of things, but also nothing much. We still live in the same houses, drive similar cars on the same roads, eat the same sort of food and drink the same beer as we always have. But then again, the world of the virtual, things have changed dramatically. There is, give or take, 60 years between the invention of the first electronic numerical integrator and computer and Bitcoin. The same duration between the invention of movable type in 1450 and Pope Alexander VI threatening to excommunicate anyone who printed manuscripts without the church's approval in 1501. Within the next 20 years, everything had changed. We as a culture still have no idea what computing, let alone blockchains, are really for. 
we'll talk about this later and it's one of the things that i'd like to discuss with the, with you all in the car in, in the class but the word that i think um is being used for this inquiry the zeitgeisty bubs word for the reassessment of what computing is for is the metaverse in the last 12 years Cryptocurrency and later Web3 industry has evolved mainly by speed running ideas to their inevitable conclusion, whether the technology that those ideas need and require to exist actually exists or not. The dreams, um, the dreams we have of DAOs in 2035 all have their seeds in the technology of today. One of the things that I'll hope we'll do during this course is speed run ideas to their ultimate conclusion. Writer and theorist Paul Graham Raven, in his essay, Ways of Telling Tomorrows, makes the case for the utility of science fiction to reconcile historical tra trajectories with extrapolated trends. It acts as a kind of storehouse for tools and strategies for potential futures. When we discuss and design the future histories of DAOs, remember that the future is a sandbox today where ideas and solutions might be tested to destruction without consequence. And that's the important part here is without consequence. If you think you have a good idea and you put it into a world and speed run it to its conclusion, and you find that your idea is bad, then lean into that. Because I want to know why and what could go wrong. My background and professional specialisms are essentially operations, Web3, and the emerging discipline of world running, i.e. the running of worlds. Just as a showrunner is to a TV show, a world runner is to a world. I'm going to talk about weird futures and how we can go about creating them, because we'll need some solid ground to stand on in 2035. We'll need to discover an imaginary vantage point to look backwards from. And I'm going to briefly cover three disciplines. World building, worlding, and world running. I hope that this will set the mood and the tone for what Ross and I are hoping to create collectively with you all during the, uh, the duration of this series. I won't be talking about my own ideas of DAOs of the future today, um, but instead I'll give you some idea about how, how you could go about creating worlds that the DAOs of 2035 could live in. Things to think about when you're constructing their future histories. Worlds are containers, self-consistent spaces that have an edge. They can be entered, they can be entered or just observed. All worlds are navigated by protocol both technological protocols, but also behavioral. As is popular and zeitgeisty to say, they could be navigated, we could, we could say that they are navigated by both rules and law. To build a world, one must first decide what kind of world the container contains. I highly recommend the book, Building Imaginary Worlds um, and the Theory and History of Subcreation by Mark J.P. Wolf. Um, if you haven't encountered the discipline of or well, the theoretical discipline of world running, uh, world building before. It's a really good book, fascinating. Um, one of my personal favorite tools for world building is the political compass meme, so beloved of Twitter and Reddit. If you are extremely online like I am, I'm sure you've seen one of these before. In 2019, I worked on a project about multi-species sustainability with Dr. Christoph Ruprecht at Koyeto uh, University. And we were discussing the kind of world or worlds that are created or evoked by the idea of multi-species sustainability. Uh, let's wait for this to load. It's a massive image. Unsure as how to approach this, we ended up making a political compass. Um, animist, big table, Zapatista, pluriverse is one of my favorite features, um, as is computationally landscape, Bitcoin, forest, kin, um, yeah, it was, it's really, um, I'll drop this in the discord, that image, but businesses, futurists and foresight people are all, of course, no strangers to the idea of the two by two. At the time in my own work, I've been contrasting the ideas of a bright green, optimistic anthropogreen against the climate nihilism of the status quo, AKA the Anthropocene. We then chose two opposing attitudes or motivations to approach these ideas. Is society going to salvage the future or rescue it? This then completed the second axis. But taking the aesthetic maximalism of 2019 meme sphere uh, to heart, we expanded the compass out into a four by four grid, giving us 16 possible futures. We then spoke together over email about the thinkers and writers that had influenced our work and the wider multi-species field. 
We discussed how they were related, how is the work of one scholar different from another, and we used the axes within the graph to spatialize the relationships that we thought um, existed between thinkers and organize them onto a grid as best we could. We then filled each box with bizarre and evocative ideas just weird enough to make people think. The, juxtap the juxtaposition of them relationally la laid out on the grid allows the viewer to compare and contrast ideas very quickly. Whilst the image on screen contains 16 futures, the whole image represents one idea of a multi-species future. The axes were central ideas about what was true about the multi-species futures that we were thinking about. So if we were to change the axes, we would change the lens and the spatialization of the futures that we imagined. When it comes to pitching and thinking about DAOs, um, in the second half of the course, you will need to decide what is true about the world that those DAOs exist in. What axioms are the most important and what sort of tensions do those axioms create? Fill the compass with ideas and then decide which future history the DAO will be situated in. Better yet, pick a weird future and then imagine how the, how the DAOs may impact that world and then shift it or move it from one future history square to another. I really recommend collectively trying this exercise um, in your groups later um, uh, in the course, or even just personally, if you wanna think about futures. Um, it's quite a fun exercise. I'm not gonna build my own compass today in this talk, but for the purposes of right now, let's pick four things that we can be pretty sure will be true about the world of 2035. Climate change, cryptocurrencies, or unstoppable code machines, collapse, and the metaverse. So we have our world building. Next, we need to world. So worlding is a term used by simulation artist Ian Cheng. His book, Emissary's Guide to Worlding, is one of the best books about worlds, and to be honest, creativity um, I've ever read. I really recommend it. I think you can get it at worlding2.live or live, but you can um, find the URL. It's on Amazon as an ebook. So worlding is a different discipline to world building. And Ian Cheng says that worlding is the unnatural art of creating an infinite game by choosing a present, storytelling its past, simulating its futures, and nurturing its changes. To put it into different terms, world, world building is imagining the world of a novel. Worlding is the active process of writing it, bringing it to life. The world for an author is alive whilst they are writing it, and for the reader, the world is alive when they are reading. The purpose of a world is to world. The, pur the purpose of a world is to live, and a, a world will continue to live after um, you have experienced it, both as a writer and as a reader. In the same way, a tale is always alive in its telling. So here's one feature um, that I wrote in less than 200 words. I also put the whole 200 words into. Um, Disco Diffusion, and this is the image that it gave me, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, the world is still reeling from a decade of multiple global shocks. Humanity, and in particular the Western world, has finally come face to face with what climate change really meant for them. Corporations marshaled resources, and so did nation states, one protecting profit, the other sovereignty. Did either protect people? Not so much. The metaverse discussions a decade earlier it turned out was less about whatever Facebook had been trying to sell and more about a collective re-evaluation of how society interacted with and related to the internet. This introspection had first begun during the lockdowns as part of the first pandemic and continued throughout the decade. A societal re-evaluation of what the virtual is for and its place in our lives was inevitable. The internet, databases, and the virtual resulted in the terrain of the metaverse becoming recognizably more coextensive with our own. Yes, you are still you, but different on the internet. But by 2035, it was well understood that if you are navigating a city with a map on a smartphone, you are in the metaverse. So where will we see gig worker DAOs as worker cooperatives mixed with gaming guilds? Does the concept of gig work even still exist in a world where tokens are infinitely composable and recomposable across a digital economy, separate from the world of the dollar? Are these DAOs worker, user, or community owned? Are they corporate owned? Do they interact with local government? Is the local government even a DAO? 
or is the local government a DAO even? Are collective task apps totally normalized across society? Is it even thought of as work or is it civic duty? If so, where does this duty lie? To one's community, to the DAO, to the nation, to a corporation? Are there DAOs solely devoted to watering freshly planted street trees with gray water from the sink? And does the same DAO or a different one trim or cut the trees in winter? Are there jobs? Are they tasks or are they quests? Do people get points, badges, or does a continued interaction with tasks to be done in one DAO give them access to continued membership to larger DAOs, like membership of a locally grown vegetable food box, for example? How does this all work? You tell me. So on to world running. In the world of Damon by Daniel Suarez, which is this course is named after, participants are connected via the dark net Using, augment, using augmented reality video game engine and headsets. Users have created their own ranking system and economy. Online identities mimic MMORPGs uh, with operatives doing tasks to gain levels and gaining access to new technologies with help from the AI, which is the main protagonist of the story. In the book sequel, Freedom, numerous towns have slowly joined the Daemon's network as a means to improve their own situations and their society as a whole. It is curious that DAOs in 2022 have thrust a line of popular intellectual quiet, uh, have thrust a line of intellectual inquiry into the wider public imagination. People are thinking about organization design, governments, governance, sorry, and coordination mechanisms using the internet in far greater numbers than they ever have before. True, as Ross will explain, 21st century meme culture and real-time chat have combined in DAOs to create a hellish kind of technocratic LARP. The rolling AGM as a model participatory, let me start that again. The rolling AGM as a model participatory form. Endless 24 discussion in a token enabled group chats on Discord with a shared bank account seem to make up a DAO. It is the blockchain as a technological imaginary that has inspired this line of inquiry. But what sort of innovations and experiments in the blockchain sphere, uh, what sort of effects the innovations and experiments in the blockchain sphere might have on the wider world as its gravity continues to grow? Will it be where we reimagine the way that we coordinate, conspire, and govern ourselves with digital tools? Combined with the realm that we currently call video games, I believe that we might. The role of a world runner is to continually steer an existing world towards aliveness. One of the many concerns of a world runner are the practicalities of continuing the work of worlding the world. If we consider DAOs, code spaces, institutions, corporations, or even airports as kinds of worlds, then we can break down the needs of running the world, both by the world runners and the inhabitants into various elements. Two mechanisms or levers that we have steering an existing world right now are governance and coordination. This is a this is a drum that I've been banging for a number of years. Um, the wider Web3 community and DAOs as a design space currently don't make much of a distinction between governance and the mechanisms of governance, aka coordination. Put simply, to my mind, governance is de decisions about the whole, by the whole, that affect the running of the whole. But coordination is the successful running of the whole without affecting the whole's running. Coordination is any mechanism or protocol that allows people to run the whole, whether this be a project management tool, policy, a plan, or a succession model. Let's for a moment take an example mechanism so beloved of DAOs since their early beginnings, voting. I ask the question, is voting a governance mechanism or a coordination mechanism? I believe voting is simply a mechanism that enables either. Imagine for a moment that you, I, and all of us involved in this course are somewhere in person. The cinema, uh, this seminar has finished and we are standing in the street trying to decide what to have for lunch. If we vote for sushi, is that an act of governance or is it a mechanism of coordination? Going further, is voting sushi for lunch an important enough collective decision to enter into an unstoppable, immutable public ledger? I don't think so. It was simply a coordinative act that didn't affect the whole. The 2020 essay, Modular Politics, Towards a Governance Layer for Online Communities, proposes four design features for modeling and specifying a, spec a speculative, speculative governance layer for online networks. 
Those four are modularity, platform operators, and community members should have the ability to construct systems by creating, importing, and arranging composable parts together as a coherent whole. Expressiveness, the governance layer should be able to implement as wide a range of processes as possible. Portability, governance tools developed for one platform should be portable to another platform for reuse and adaption. Interoperability, governance systems operating on different platforms and protocols should have the ability to interact with one another, sharing data and influence each, influencing each other's processes. What I might, what I'm interested about this is can we design and invent new kinds of coordination mechanisms for the purpose of coordinating DAOs? Can those mechanisms be useful in other governance situations, in other applications beyond the blockchain, in video games, in a group chat, on social media, or wherever? Can we imagine new ways of coming to an agreement in real time in a group chat? What about a Discord? What about a Discord with 10,000 people? How do you even get 10,000 people to make a decision in real time? If we develop these tools, or we, can we even imagine them in place in the world of 2035, what do they look like? What sort of downstream effects could these ideas have on other areas of our lives? What if our workplaces had both better coordination and governance tools integrated into Discord, Slack, or WhatsApp? How quickly could the family group chat organize their yearly get together, make arrangements and keep everyone happy? Is your family the kind of family where a democracy is worth 51% of the vote, or does it need a quorum? Do people even need to vote? Can the expression of sentiment work just as well? What are emojis for? Does the family group chat need to be a DAO to benefit from real-time coordination tools? Probably not. What sort of governance do group chats need today? Can different people inside the same DAO, the same Discord, have different forms of governance? A direct, a direct consensus democracy faction versus a 51% democracy, each with 50% of the members of the Discord in either. Can anarchists, democrats, and autocrats all live inside projects with longer goals? What happens if we project all of this forward and then look backwards? One of the things that intrigues me about DAOs due to, their, due to the permanent nature of the blockchain is once they're spun up, they always exist. So how does one close down a DAO? Is there a DAO in the future that specializes in wrapping up zombie DAOs, redirecting effort, capital, and energy into other related domains? DAOs, it seems to me, could be useful for coordinating mechanisms, mechanisms that allow people to stay connected to, um, and, and, to, and to participate in projects that are well beyond the usual horizon of contemporary capitalism. The project, the project of the 21st century is the regreening of the earth, yet, it takes 100 years to grow an oak tree. Could a redwood DAO of 2035 be hunkering down and mentally preparing itself and its community for two to 5,000 years of a coordination? What does governance and responsible land management look like in this context? Perhaps the organization and form of the DAO allows us to consider these vast time horizons. How do you design an organization that is prepared to see the fruits of its labor flourish centuries or millennia after members have done their work? Are our assumptions about what DAOs are today compatible with the idea of multi-generational governance and coordination? Previously, only empires, nation states, and perhaps the church has been so bold to believe that they could manage such a vision. Can we use the attitude, the ideas of unstoppable code and the forever database and the world computer to inspire such long-term thinking. Throughout this whole course, let your imaginations run wild. Um, that's the most important thing. Whilst we're here to learn about the technological systems of today, it's our collective desires and ambitions that should shape technological development in open systems. If we get seduced by those systems themselves, however, possibilities are closed down, horizons are shortened, and futures are denied. Go wild. Ideas are very cheap have lots of them, and ideas are just that, ideas. Whether you think they are good or bad, allow, um, speak them aloud, and then follow them through to their inevitable conclusions or destruction. In 2035, what does an international DAO for focus group participants look like, or a DAO for mystery shoppers? What about a DAO for beach restoration run by surfers, or DAOs for wild swimmers funded in part by a river restoration DAO? I'll leave you with this image on the next slide that I saw on Tumblr, Tumblr the other day as a prompt. 
What does the Dow of twenty thirty? Uh, what does the Dow of twenty thirty five that brings this sign to life, and its con and its conclusions look like? Um, how would you build it? What are the successes and what are the failures along the way? Within this one poster, there is effort, eating, trading, growing, restoring the world. It's all there. Community. Um, yeah, and I think this sort of image for me is very evocative and um, many designs could be could come out of this one, you know, one prompt. Uh, yeah, so that's me. That was 30 minutes. Cheers. I'll stop sharing. <clears throat> Thanks, Jay. That was that was really great. Um, really great hearing all of the the words to go with the images. I was trying to kind of imagine where you would go with some of that um, when you shared it earlier. Um, got lots of annotations I'd like to make um, to, to, to what you were saying, but I think that um, some of them I'll definitely try and bring up in in my talk. But um, yeah, we'll we'll make sure to get into it in the the Q and A and Discord etc. Afterwards. Okay, let me just share my screen again. Um, there we are. Is that is that coming up? Yeah, amazing. Yep. Great. Okay. So the title for my talk is Altered States. Um, yeah, there are my contact details if anyone wants or needs them. Um, let me just go back to the start of my there we are. Um so as a kind of epigraph to to this talk um i've got this quotation from from donna haraway's staying with the trouble we are compost not post-human we inhabit the human actually i don't know how to pronounce that word the humusities i'm going to call it not the humanities oh humus right so the humusities not the humanities um philosophically and materially i am a compostist not a post-humanist critters human and not become with each other compose and decompose each other in every scale and register of time and stuff in sympoetic tangling in ecological evolutionary developmental earthly welding and unwelding and it's partly that last phrase there that i thought could make a nice link with what jay was talking about in his talk but also this word compost um, which is something that jay and i were discussing the other day in relation to, oh, that's too soon, in relation to, I guess, the first thing that I wanted to do in my talk today, which is to, um, or one of the things I wanted to do, um, which is to, yeah, talk a little bit about the syllabus um, and what it's for, and to chart a bit of a path through some of the set texts that we, that we put on the syllabus for today, um, which were Damon, Accelerando, uh, Vitalik's paper, DAOs, DAs, DACs, and I've actually forgotten the name, but an incomplete terminology guide is uh, what I'll be referring to it as. And also uh, Nathan Schneider's text about, um, again, I think it's called, um, can we encode human rights on the blockchain? Basic, just to say it basically, we view all of these texts as compost, less as things to be, to have the tools of critical analysis applied to them and more material to be taken from, to be used, to be recombined, even to be abused, as I'll go on to mention. The other thing I wanted to do in this talk is to, I guess, amplify, uh, to zone in on something that Jay um, mentioned in his talk and to amplify it, which is this question of, leaning into what might seem like bad ideas. That's probably the main thing I'll be discussing today. So in preparation for, for this, uh, I inevitably spent a lot of time thinking about what are good ideas for DAOs or what are good DAOs, what are DAOs that are good at being DAOs. And it wasn't hard to come up with such a list. So um, 
this is the list of some of the partners um, or it's the list on the partners page of Zodiac, the new project from Gnosis Guild. Some of these might be familiar to you. Um, if they're not, I definitely recommend looking into them. Um, these are DAOs which are run in a very effective, exemplary way, are working on very interesting projects and work very well together and have a track record of, uh, of, of delivering on the, the promise that they, they have. But on this course, we don't want you to limit yourself to feasible, realistic and good ideas. Um, as I mentioned, we'd like you to lean into the bad, to push to the extremes. And another word for bad, you know, I actually have got no problem at all with simply bad ideas, bad DAOs. I think that a lot can be learned that way in the spirit of testing to destruction without consequence, if I'm not mangling the, uh, the quotation that uh, Jay had up earlier. But another word is trouble or troubling, troubling ideas for DAOs. So this again is from Donna Haraway. Trouble is an interesting word. It derives from a 13th century French verb, meaning to stir up, to make cloudy, to disturb. We, all of us on terror, live in disturbing times, mixed up times, troubling and turbid times. This, as I'll go on to explain, is, uh, is, is definitely, if you feel that you come across an idea that has something of this to it, it's definitely one to pursue. So to speak about the, the text from which our course gets its name, Daemon. The Daemon is a DAO-like organization. I think there's an argument to be made that it is in fact, it does tick the boxes of, of being a DAO in Vitalik's definition. And it's definitely a troubling DAO in all sorts of ways. It's scale and it's reach are troubling in part. Also, it's, it's use of violence, it's use of coercion, the lack of maneuver that the humans who find themselves entangled with it experience is troubling. And the way that I want to talk about the daemon, but also this, you know, this aspect of what's troubling about it is through this, this angle of scale, the scale of its project if we look at it that way so i've been thinking about the uh, this question of the the proper size and scale of DAOs um, a lot in the last six months or so and um, particularly in the last couple of weeks um, since i saw this this tweet by david phelps the thing about most crypto companies is that they're not they're not companies companies make money through revenue Crypto projects make money through native currencies they mint, distribute, bank, and transact in, i.e. their countries. Now, this is uh, this idea of crypto projects being like countries, um, existing on the scale of countries, is something that you'll find a great deal around, around crypto Twitter. Sorry, one second. Uh. Sorry, one second, I'm just got to react to this. Is that, is that right, Jay? <laughs> from, what, from what you were messaging about? Anyway, let me carry on. I'll, I'll watch the uh, messages, if not. It's all good now. Uh, I can let you know when it pops up again. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Sorry, I wasn't aware that that was, that was happening. No, it's, it, it just comes and goes, it's fine. Okay, okay. Um, so yeah, this question of uh, crypto projects being like countries is something that you'll find a lot on crypto Twitter. Um, and here we, you know, in 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 the in in relation to that, maybe here we get our first DAO idea, perhaps our first bad DAO idea, um, the idea of buying an entire Caribbean island through crowdfunding to start their own country. Now, not not uh, not not bad in itself. Um, but I, I feel like it's, uh, I'm saying that because in part, I feel like it bears on some fairly uh, kind of right libertarian um, ideas regarding um, the founding of nation states, um, which I think we could probably do without, in, given, given the other 
uh, the other problems, the other challenges that we have these days. Um, I feel like this is sort of plowing a uh, kind of ideological furrow, which is uh, definitely goes back to Hayek through the sovereign individual and the network state. Um, even before that, I was, I mean, it was also in the context of a tweet like this from uh, from Graham from Mirror that um, started me thinking about uh, this notion of DAOs and countries or DAOs and nations. DAOs are extreme organizations. They thrive either in contexts of singular focus, like raising $50 million to buy the constitution or as on-chain nations like Bitcoin or Ethereum. DAOs struggle in slow marshes where loyalty and predictability, tenants of um, traditional management are vital. Um, I think this brings up quite an interesting question of the, the, the extremes of the size of DAOs. So Jay brought up this idea of uh, how you might have a, a discord or a, a, a kind of locus of coordination for 100,000 people. Um, and how, how, how difficult that would be. In this instance, we've got um, an invocation of Bitcoin and Ethereum being like countries, but also being DAOs in and of themselves. So um, I think, I forget whether it's in, I don't think Vitalik mentions this in uh, an incomplete terminology guide, but certainly on some of the other texts that were optional for this week, some of his earlier writings about about DAOs and DACs, and also Ralph Merkel's paper that is on the reading list for week four, um, you come across this idea of Bitcoin itself being a DAO. Um, as you know, Vitalik does mention it in, in a complete terminology guide. And I won't go through the steps of the argument right now, but I think it's definitely something to familiarize yourself with the argument as to why something at the kind of protocol level like Bitcoin uh, might be considered um, might be considered a DAO. At the other extreme, you have these, these kind of micro-focused um, DAOs, like this one's referring to Constitution DAO. And I've got another idea for a DAO here, um, which I think similarly has that, that sense of incredibly tight focus from Punk4156. Start a DAO that vacuums up every NFT older than X and cheaper than Y. Do it algorithmically. Don't even look at the art. Hold for 10 years. Something I find interesting about this is that I think that an idea like this, if, if indeed put into practice, would have the potential to be a decentralized autonomous organization as opposed to just a decentralized organization. You'll, you'll be familiar with the distinction from Vitalik's paper. Anyone? want to venture an opinion as to why I'm saying that. Just shout out, I can't see all your names or faces if anyone's putting their, their hand up. Anyone? It's not a test. I it's guess, a, because it, I'm sorry. Because the algorithm would actually decide on what to buy. Right, exactly. It sort of includes this, this crucial element of, um, of automation to make the DAO's decision-making process autonomous. And, you know, I'm mentioning those two words together, autonomy and automation, because Vitalik kind of elides them as well. And I think that's a really important thing to, to note in that particular paper. Um, in, his, uh, in his squares here, yeah, I think, I think that this DAO idea would pretty much kind of tick the boxes that we have there. Um, the, obviously, it would need human beings to provide internal capital, but then it certainly does have this sense of automation at the center and humans at the edges. Presumably, the uh, humans involved in this DAO could happily stay by the sidelines until uh, you know numerous stages of this digital antiquities market have have passed, and they can just take profit on the artworks that they've accumulated by being members of this DAO. Um, and they'll be happy, or potentially not, if the, if the algorithm uh, decides to enact some kind of unforeseen consequences of the way that it was 
the way that it's programmed, the way that it was set up. Um, while we're at this end of the spectrum of kind yeah. of micro focus uh, DAOs, well, yeah. Sorry, just just a, a quick question before you you, you go forward. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, about the the, the vacuum in uh, NFT cleaner, like why does it have to be a, a DAO or not just a I don't know a, a simple app or something like that? Because it's it's just a it it has a pretty straightforward uh, rule and then it has a, a, a very simple input and a very simple output. Mm. And why is it like decentralized? Because I, I, I think this could be also like very centralized because and actually this the kind of the the center would be actually the the simple algorithm. And then yeah how 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 why does it why would this be a, a DAO and not just a software i don't know yeah i mean that's a great question um if you don't mind let's get into that in the the q a portion at the uh, at the end but yeah we'll we'll definitely have a, have a think about that um i was going to give you a couple of uh a couple of micro focused um dao ideas as well um we had this from a couple of months ago the the bear market screaming therapy group so uh, bear market screaming therapy group um this uh, yeah, you can you can see pretty much what amounts to the, um, I guess the entire constitution or uh, uh, entire sort of raison d'etre of this DAO uh, named underneath. I'm not sure it really needs to explain very much more. You're only allowed to send screaming voice notes. Uh, everything else is a ban. Text, pictures, etc. is a ban. Anything other than screaming is a ban. You think you're smart? It's a ban. No token. So um, obviously quite tongue in cheek, but. Um, something I yeah I find it I find a kind of interesting um, general kind of container for a DAO idea, in that it bears on something that you might call a kind of technology of the self, um, a uh, in this case a type of therapy which is probably very transformative for those who take part. Not necessarily a troubling idea. Slightly more troubling ideas might be. I mean, you know, these aren't radically troubling, but still, uh, I um, before before um, setting up Impossible Object, I started and then paused the training to uh, become a Lacanian analyst, and that's been entering my mind um, in the last couple of months in terms of thinking of ideas for DAOs. And I think certainly a kind of psycho psychoanalysis themed DAO would probably be quite troubling. Um, and chaotic and a real hot mess um, because you know any of you who are familiar with the trajectories of psychoanalytic movements in the 20th, 20th century i suppose knows how much they functioned like dysfunctional DAOs in many regards uh, in terms of the use of governance and uh, law i guess you could call it and also schisms and forks and all of these kind of things could be kind of um projected onto them um klein dao i think would be particularly difficult um to to turn into a dao form of any sort but yeah there's there's a yeah a, an idea there possibly worthy of pushing to its absurd conclusion fanon dao actually might be a bit more workable um i think the idea of maybe a horizontal group therapy dao has has some sort of potential so these are some some more kind of micro focused DAOs. But to get back to the main theme of um, really the kind of troubling nature of large scale projects at the other end, um, we have the daemon. And I wanted to address the question of why we why we chose this text. So um, there's the I guess the 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 relatively straightforward, the relatively obvious reason, um, which is that uh, uh, Vitalik has mentioned on several occasions that the the daemon was a direct inspiration for the um, for the DAO concept, and indeed for Ethereum more generally. Um, he's mentioned on other on other occasions. Um, 
and it seemed like an important or, or a text for us to to immerse ourselves in. But sticking with that idea of immersion, one thing that there is to say about about the book is it's an example or a portrait of total immersion of something close to the Dow model. Um, immersion of human subjects in a completely thought through and airless plan with no gaps. And through of coercion and the, the sorts of tasks that humans undertake through that, um, we get a sense of the total transformation of their reality um, in yeah, the reality of these humans who are close to the, the daemon in the interest of forcing a certain type of future into existence. Um, and this is a, a prompt to remember when you're doing ideas, the, maybe not just to remember, but to keep front and center the human beings who will be making your abstract ideas happen and also disrupting them. Um, David must have had state-sized projects on the mind on that particular day in uh, on the 4th of August, because he also, he also tweeted this. The whole point of DAO should be to break us from 50 years of failed milquetoast centrism by enabling small passionate subgroups, rewarding the passion of contrarian bets rather than social pressure to appease the leaders. This should be the goal of DAOs. It's not. The thing that I responded to particularly about that, I suppose, was this was this mention of failed milquetoast centrism. And I guess, first of all, I don't agree that we've had 50 years of milquetoast centrism. Um, I think if anything, we've had 50 years of, or coming on for 50 years of extreme centrism, to borrow Tarek Ali's phrase. And relating this to the question of states or state-sized projects, um, of, of state-sized mega projects, which I think is a term we could definitely apply to what the daemon is trying to, trying to achieve in the first book and Freedom TM. I felt it was, this is something I suppose I found myself thinking about in relation to the, the question of the, the, uh, the, the politicization of the, the crypto space. Um, there's, you sometimes get the sense from uh, the way that founders talk or the, the, the discussion that goes on in, uh, in, in crypto spaces that there's a general sense of depoliticization or of people not being avowedly political. Um, but that, but this space has been created by political activity. Um, and the, the, the activities that DAOs might apply themselves to likewise have been created by political activity. And this mention of failed milquetoast centrism made me think, well, what is, what is that? What was that political activity that created the, uh, the domain for DAOs to, to plant their flags within? And just to give a very brief sketch of it, I think one thing that creates that is the, that, that political space is clearly the ravages and failures of neoliberalism, which are themselves very troubling. Um, one text that we have on our um, syllabus that I very much recommend reading is James Meek's Private Island, um, which is one of the one of the best texts that I know, at least, of um, the the effects that decades of privatization have had on um, public utilities and public goods um, in the United Kingdom. Um, had originally been planning to dwell on this uh, a lot more. I'm not going to for reasons of time, um, other than just to suggest that you do take a look at it. Um, if only to run some thought experiments on, uh, on one of these chapters, which is to, to yeah, read any chapter of your choice and ask yourself how a DAO or a decentralized organization would handle some of the tasks that are, that are covered in there. Um, my particular pick would be signal failure. Um, which is about the, the update of the West Coast mainline 
Um, I didn't actually know this until <laughs> until I read the book, but the West Coast Main Line is not just a single um, single train track in the UK, but it is pretty much the entire kind of rail system. And this is a this is a really fascinating um, fascinating chapter. Uh, not to spoil it for you, but it's essentially about a, a project that was was too big and it did fail. Um, and if you think about it, if you run this thought experiment in relation to DAOs, I think you might find yourself thinking that there are certain aspects of the project that would actually be run quite well by a DAO. Some aspect of this state level um, project that would be run, you know, state sized project that would be run quite, quite well by a, some future DAO. But one crucial aspect that it would definitely founder in relation to, which is that the consortium of consultants and politicians and experts who undertook this project predicated the whole thing on the emergence of a technology which still has not been proven to to work on the scale that they they required of it and this made me think about i guess an aspect of uh, of daemon that, that probably occurred to all of you which is that sobol appears to have thought everything through every single thing and which strikes me as a falsification, of course, but it also brings up this question of if if DAOs are to be automated, to be fully autonomous, how does this question of fundamental change in relation to their goal or their method of governance, how do they deal with that? As well as the obstacles of uh, of, of achieving very grand projects. That's the most recent part of the political space in which uh, uh, DAOs have, have sprung up, I feel. Uh, preceding that, the, uh, the text that I would go to, uh, Jay mentioned it in his, um, in his talk earlier, the text that I would go to to, to, to think about the, uh, the preceding uh, era from neoliberalism would be, would be this, would be seen like a state by James C. Scott. Um, it's kind of an interesting, you know, those are two interesting uh, the James Meek book and this one are uh, interesting texts to to read side by side in that what you see in Private Island is a state, the UK, attempting to handle uh, the kind of mega projects that are described in Seeing Like a State, except that the UK is no longer the type of state that is described in Seeing Like a State. In the sense that Sir so James C. Scott, if you're familiar with the, the book, you'll know he refers to uh, a variety of, um, of states between the 18th century and the 20th um, as high modernist states. Um, an, example, an example of this being, you know, just to pick one almost at random, um, is post-war Brazil, um, which he discusses in relation to the construction of Brasilia. Um, forgive me if I'm pronouncing that badly, Lucifer's in the house. Um, and like I said, this is the other half of the space, um, the political space that DAOs emerge in, is the waning of the high modernist state, um, which we can still learn something from in terms of this question of the scale of projects that could be attempted by large collectives of people with the size and resources of DAOs. So the TLDR of um, seeing like a state is that one reason that their grand projects, the, the grand projects of high modernist states founded was from too much seduction, too much of the idea of system seduction, seduction of a, of a beautiful overarching idea, which does not really include the human beings who are going to be building it or living it. This is very obviously evident in the, the chapter about Brasilia. Um, this uh, massive uh, Le Corbusier inspired perfect city, um, which ended up having, or well, one, one of the things that the inhabitants ended up missing the most was, a, was the life of the street, was any sense of being able to have somewhere to, to congregate. Um, as well as, Many, yeah, many of the other projects that that um, are, are described here, which um, end up being, in a sense, too fragile 
um, on the one hand, sort of too too forceful, and on the other hand, too fragile because they fail to see the consequences, um, which may transpire only decades after. So yeah, to me, these are the these are the brackets of the political space in which DAOs um, emerge. So um, we have the hyper modernist state. Uh, proving to be too fragile because it fails to see the consequences that transpired decades after, and the considerably more anarchic neoliberal state, which abdicates from the very responsibilities that were taken up, perhaps in a, in a violent way by the high modernist state. And that had their possibility to interpose themselves somewhere in that space between the state and capital. Um, a point that Nathan Schneider makes, I think actually not, not in the, uh, the piece that we put on the required reading for this week, but in his interview with uh, the Blockchain Socialist, which I think is under the optional text and is on the reading list for later weeks as well, is that certainly there are, there are some tasks that, that probably shouldn't be taken off the state's plate. So building infrastructure is one of them. But as I mentioned, it might be a good seed for a troubling idea for a DAO to do exactly that and just see what happens. Of course, here I'm speaking mostly in a Western European and North American context, um, which I've chosen really um, because of this was the cultural milieu in which Ethereum emerged. And Ethereum is the, the prime protocol that we, uh, that much DAO exploration has been done uh, done on in the last um, so many years. A very different story could be told regarding the, recept uh, regarding the reception that DAOs are finding and might find in other parts of the world. And for our purposes, um, it's probably more useful to think about what comes after the neoliberal state or the imitation democracy or the absolute monarchy than necessarily before it. So even though I've been focusing on the uh, the, the pastness of of this you know, creation of this space, um, yeah, I think that it may be more fruitful to think about what comes next. Um, just to provide a bit of a placeholder to think about that, I've got some of Joshua Cetarella's flags representing uh, of the the incredible variety of different ideologies that have been uh, welded into existence by Politogram. Um, to tie together, you know, another aspect of um, seeing like a state and private island and bring this back more directly to the question of DAOs. There's a, there's a theme that, um, so I've already mentioned this, that one of the, uh, the symptoms that James C. Scott diagnoses in the high modernist state is the sense of being too, too seduced by beautiful systems. And this is something that you really find everywhere in DAO related liter literature. So I'm just taking this one example from uh, Jaya Clara Brecker's essay in Radical Friends, which again is a text I'd very much recommend everyone read. Um, she's speaking here about uh, one, one meaning of de decentralization, which is a troubling one, um, which is the idea of the market knowing best, the market knowing how to, uh, to provide for the needs of the humans who live, live within it or at its mercy. These events should be a lesson and a backdrop for anyone who reads white papers and nifty mechanism designs. A model is very different from how systems affect real people and environments. Be wary of getting obsessed by the beautiful model, the white paper, and the great idea. Despite the fact that we might have sophisticated and even beautiful ideas for things like governance, we can rely on them becoming wearing, wearing, wearisome and wearing. Um, you know, I thought this this tweet here was a good uh, a good kind of evocation of that. I don't want to engage with a governance platform. 
I want to live my life. I want to fall in love and watch the Perseids from a mountaintop. Every incentivization of my behavior is a distraction from and a, an attack on the life I see as valuable. Um, and a good corrective to this in terms of thinking about your, your design process for coming up with your, your DAO ideas is really to read texts which deal with how humans live in and deform systems, how they come to the system or the technology rather than the system or technology coming to them and in fact leaving them maybe with very little choice but to adopt it and react to it as happens in Daemon. So, you know, just a brief selection of text there. Certainly, I'd recommend uh, seeing like a state. Um, you know, there's a great anecdote towards the end that I was thinking about just before this, um, this call today um, about how two non-official types of worker were absolutely essential to the running of East German factories. Um, and that's the, the jack of all trades, the tinkerer who could fix every machine and the black marketeer who obtained otherwise unobtainable machine pieces. Um, and the whole abstract plan simply could not function without these social actors. Um, we also have, uh, starting in the center there, Ursula Le Guin, I'd also put Philip K. Dick in this category of sci-fi writers who have a, a large, uh, have a lot of time for contingency, um, for not insisting on the simplifications and uh, the centrality of what, again, Donna Haraway might call prick tales, the simplification of narratives that you find in other sci-fi. Um, I think that Accelerando is very much in that vein as well. Um, so yeah, just to address that, uh, Accelerando like Damon, I think is, is a great text to immerse oneself in, in terms of seeing the way that the inhabitants of a certain future live all aspects of the technologies that surround them. Um, and that's, I think, the main reason that we decided that this would be a great text to have on the on the syllabus. And then finally, we've got Michel de Certeau's The Practice of Everyday Life, um, which is in a similar kind of vein uh, to seeing like a state. Um, it's about the activities that subjects engage in to deform systems to make them livable and i think these are things that are all worth bearing in mind when you're designing your DAO ideas and to draw things to to a close um i wanted to put forward that there is something so we've, I've talked a little bit here about uh, texts which deal with this question of making space for the subject within uh, within grand systems. Um, and in the course of this last couple of days, I've been finding myself thinking more and more that there is, you know, and these grand systems are ones that, as I've mentioned, do not necessarily make make space for the subject um, as a as a matter of course, there is something quite anti-human about the pure idea of the Tao, um, which is is definitely there in the diagram. The idea of humans being pushed to the edges um, and automation at the center is is a slightly troubling idea, and maybe one that we can get into a little bit later in the in the Q and A. Um, But as we saw earlier, or as I started off by, by arguing, trouble is not necessarily something to edit out um, or to use as a pretext for rejecting idea, an idea. Trouble, troubling, and troubled are words for the murky, that which does not resolve easily, that which does not have a clear conclusion. And as such, they are perfect for the projection into the future that we're asking you to do leading into the trouble is a feature of the exercise and not a bug. We can expect the question of the broader implementation of DAOs to be troubling, one best thought, both in terms of overarching historical processes and the humans who will be living those and living those in surprising ways, especially if 
as under the conditions of this exercise. We want you to think about how dice, dice, how DAOs might be involved in a move from one possible future to another, as Jay was um, demonstrating so vividly with his political compass earlier. How are we doing for time? Um, I've got a quick little coda here. This is pretty yeah, much where going. I wanted to. Yeah, it's pretty much where I wanted to end um, end my talk there. But yeah, just to move on into this 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 coda. Um, a couple of things that didn't make it into the mainstream of this talk, but I nevertheless think are, are worth bringing up. So um, one is to do with this, uh, this essay, again, on the syllabus called Positive Some Worlds, Remaking Public Goods um, by Other Internet. And we've got this quote. So every one of us is a beneficiary of the public goods of society's past. These grand projects humble us. Cathedrals, grand canals, sanitation, the expansion of mass literacy. They tell us that the goodness of a public good is also measured in terms of its longevity. To match these great works, we must extend our time horizon. We want to ensure positive outcomes, not just for token holders or protocol participants, but for the world co coextensive with these infrastructures. How can we leverage the immutability afforded by crypto protocols to create things that outlast us, forming the foundation of civilizational longevity. So what this brings up for me is, um, I suppose, first of all, it bears on this question of the, uh, the public goods that DAOs could be involved in creating, but also this question of how the endeavors of a DAO spill over into the real world. How do the, the online uh, metaversal governing and coordinating capacities of DAOs turn into lasting IRL institutions and jurisdictions. Again, that idea of new jurisdictions is, uh, is a phrase that Nathan Schneider has for the promise of, of DAOs and crypto more generally. There's also this little list of uh, large scale projects that, um, that DAOs could potentially engage in. Uh, or some some version of these at the very least. So a national investment bank, I'd maybe transform that into something else like a, like a, a national investment unbank or a national investment bank for the unbanked. Something of that sort might be a kind of intriguing idea to pursue. Um, an American edible garden forest agrobiome, new models of urbanism. Um, I certainly think that DAOs could play a, um, a great role in that kind of area. Um, those interested in this kind of thing might want to look into City DAO, uh, which I, I forget whether that's on the the list of Zodiac partners, but yeah, certainly one to to look into. Um, and then research and design in science. These are things that I know that when I read this list and was thinking about potential applications to DAO, so I found myself thinking that these are yeah no a DAO couldn't do this. This isn't something that that um, it could go near. But again, maybe that's the trigger for for pushing ahead and trying to think about exactly how a DAO would handle um, tasks of this type. And then finally, um, my own idea for a uh, potentially troubling, uh, troubling type of DAO. Um, this was something I just put on Twitter the other day. Um, aping Punk 4156's idea of the, the NFT vacuuming DAO. Start a DAO that keys all SEVs, decide targets algorithmically, do it for 10 years. So this was taking as, the, uh, as, a, as an inspiration, um, the simple act of violence that uh, those of you familiar with Andreas's, Andreas Malm's work, um, the simple act of violence that Andreas Malm um, recommends those who are serious about climate activism engaging, which is, I haven't got the John Lanchester quote that this arises from, but it's this idea, it's, it's this note of surprise that Andreas Mom and John Lanchester have that there hasn't been more terrorism related to, uh, to, to the environment, um, not even of the simple sort of running your keys across um, SEVs. Um, at the cost of thousands of pounds worth of damage each time. And ideally, 
the uh, the total disappearance of these vehicles from our streets within a very short time. Um, the the Dow idea that I I, I kind of uh, spun up from this 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 germ I'm calling weather overground uh, in homage to the um, weather weather underground of the 60s and the the idea behind this um, it's going to give you a really quick version of it is uh, is a Dow for some years hence um, in which the keying of SEVs is just the just the starting point. Um, and in fact, the those participating in this DAO engaging in not fatal violence for sure, but but um, violence against uh, property that is to do with is the possession of the fossil fuel industry, um, with a view to to simply shutting down um, uh, various of the most polluting activities um, that, that are engaged in. Um, this being particularly inspired by um, the type of movements that again Andreas Mom uh, refers to in um, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, uh, including Ende Galenda, uh, if you're familiar with that, and, and others. And the main thing I found myself thinking about in relation to this, um, to this DAO idea, well, first of all, why is it troubling? Well, it's not troubling so much in the sense that I, it's not the element of violence uh, or in terrorism that I find troubling so much as that in thinking about it or in thinking about the future that this could belong to, I'm reminded once again that I'm bracing myself for entry into an even more violent future than our present, where maybe a consolation might be that there is more mainstream support for this kind of violent destruction of fossil fuel implicated property. But yeah, the troubling aspect is the is, is the, the wider climate of violence that it perhaps presupposes. Um, and in thinking about in, in the kind of in the back of an envelope sketch of this, this DAO, I found myself thinking about the tools that it might use. So soul bound tokens to encode participation in various actions and to fa facilitate interaction with smart contract enabled housing, transport, sustenance and legal support to address the privations and sanctions that activists would inevitably undergo. And the thing that perhaps was seemed the most interesting to me in terms of its uh, potential for future investigation is the question of privacy um, for a DAO like this and for its participation uh, for its participants in the sense that a balance would need to be struck between this movement having some necessarily clandestine activities or some activities that couldn't simply be readable by anyone on the blockchain, but definitely not being fully underground, hence weather overground, um, given that a large parts of the political force of a, a movement like this would depend on public openness about the activities in question. And, ooh, I feel like I've missed off a, uh, yeah, I seem to have missed off a slide, um, which is my imagining which weird future this would move from and to. Um, I'll see if I can find it and show you afterwards. Um, but it's a diagram from the book Climate Leviathan, if you're familiar with that, um, about how the, the activities of this DAO could involve a move from the square described as climate behemoth, which is the, I guess, sort of hyper-capitalist hell um worst possible future of climate collapse that we are um maybe fear entering into to something called climate x which is i guess to put it simply the kind of future which could include activities like this okay i'm going to leave it there thank you very much I'm trying to share my screen there we are did you want to um, proceed into a, to a short break or? Yeah, yeah, I think let's have our break there. Okay. And then we will yeah, get back together for, um, for discussion in 15 minutes. 15? Okay, great. So yep. uh, yeah, 45, we'll meet back here. Or yeah, yeah around then. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Well, okay, all right. see you all then. Okay. Bye. Yep.
Hi, everyone. So we can try to get started whenever everyone gets back. <clears throat> Testing. Yeah, so me? sounds good. Cool. Um, so welcome back, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to to say really quickly um, that we will all be kind of going through. Uh, I think we lost one or two people, um, but we'll be going through introductions now. So if you could try to limit your introductions to about thirty seconds each. I will let you know when you've gone <laughs> through your time, just to just to keep conscious and make sure everyone can go, and then we can also follow into a group discussion. We have about forty-five minutes left of the seminar. Um, we might go a few minutes over, but yeah, we'll try to stick to time. Um, and so we'll kind of, I think we can just go through uh, how my view is on my panel, um, and yeah. To, to just to add add into that to yeah. just briefly introduce yourself but then to spend yeah to to say something in response to the talks from earlier or ask us a question um so yeah introduce yourself and that within the 30 seconds an easy feat i'm sure <laughs> um i can start things off so i'll just uh I'll just get my my clock. Um, great. So my name is Nick von Kleist. I'm a moderator and also taking this class, uh, the seminar. Um, I'm from New York, but kind of live between Europe, North and North America, <laughs> um, largely moving around. I'm really interested in this course. Uh, as my work and my own practice uh, works with performance and drag and poetry and the ways that it can create portals between kind of, let's say IRL and uh, the virtual. So, so I guess we can just go down the line um, and I really apologize if I'm saying anyone's name wrong, um, but Ancha, Anka. Yeah, it's, it's Ancha, but uh, anything works. Hi. Um, Hi Ancha. Hello, I'm Ancha. I'm based in Mumbai right now. Um, currently unemployed and enjoying life. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I, start a, I start a master's program at the Bartlett in September. And um, yeah, and so I've, that's what I'm doing these days. I trained as an architect, but I was working in contemporary art for the last four years. Um, and I'm fairly new to concepts of Tao. And uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I, I have a lot of questions, but maybe I will address them soonish. Hope that's what's, okay. what's one? What's one of them? Um, I think the, um, the concepts of world running was something that, yeah, I would like to know more about. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, and actually that's exactly, I, I'm totally on the same wavelength as you. <laughs> um, so if we can move on to Alexandra. Um, Hi. Um, my name is Alexandra. I'm from Crimea. Uh, I'm an architect and urban planner. Um, I have masters in uh, prototyping future cities, and um, the thing I am interested the most about DAO is um, how it could be connected with um, urbanism and urban planning. Um, as soon as, um, like you mentioned the circle and uh, a, a 
like some time ago, I was interested in how it is possible to create uh, a city based on not strategies, but tactics uh, of life. So uh, I'm expecting to know how can I implement Go in this uh, concept. Great, thanks. That's great. Um, Carla? Hello, so I'm Carla. I'm social designer and researcher. And well, I'm, I'm from Spain and currently I'm doing a research in, in Madrid in a center which is called Media Lab. And actually my research is about uh, water ecosystem governance. And I'm particularly interested in like how um, bioremediation technologies are being used now for uh, what filtering water and these kind of things. So I'm interested in uh, in DAOs as a kind of potential tool to think about the relationship between humans and this kind of technology devices mixed with organic uh, components. Great. Great, thank you. Um... Anna or uh, Tenshi? Um, You're muted. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm Anna. I'm from Philadelphia. Um, I'm an undergraduate right now, majoring in East Asian studies and minoring in economics. Um, I have been posting probably a little bit too much to the Discord, if you've seen um, that. Um, I have a definitely a very specific interest in like money, monetary reform, and economic planning. And that's a lot of why I was really interested in this course, because like I'm getting more interested in how blockchain technology might be relevant to that. Um, and also, I'm interested in cybernetics and East Asian philosophy. So this was another whole thing with DAO. I feel like that's actually a very like serendipitous acronym. It really connects pretty well to like that concept more generally. Um, in terms of a question, one of the main things I'm interested in is the idea of like using DAOs maybe for some kind of skill sharing program. Um, and I'm guess I guess I'm just curious about like y'all know any details about how that's been done before or similar things might have been done before or if it makes sense as an idea great thanks great thank you um duda yes hi hello nice meeting everyone thank you uh jay and so I forgot my name, Ross, for the presentation. Uh, my name is Duda. I'm from Brazil. I live and work here in Rio de Janeiro. Um, for the past decade or so, I've been uh, heavily involved with uh, nightlife, and uh, I own a project space and uh, run uh, independent exhibition spaces and pretty much with uh, like independent art and music communities here. But now, but uh, recently. I still work with that, but I am also doing a master's now on communications, researching uh, kind of Web3 discourse. Um, so that's kind of where my uh, intersection with this seminar, uh, pretty much in understanding how can DAOs actually be uh, new, new ways of like uh, artistic communities collectively organizing. Uh, but both in the sense of what tools are there available that makes this new organizing co or coordination uh, uh, what tools are available to build new solutions, but also in more of the cultural aspect of like being, I don't know, a little bit more attractive today, uh, being part of a DAO than being in a part of a collective or, you know, like how these social things around uh, culturally constructed out around now are actually also shaping how people are interact with this, this. um and that's so that's, a, i'm sorry uh sorry no, no, just, just to keep it time yeah that's that's great we'll we'll loop back in the discussion thank you so much um so uh edna would you like to 
speak. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Edna Amador. I'm from Mexico, but actually, but currently I live in Barcelona. I'm finishing my undergraduate in philosophy. Uh, I'm interested in politics and technology, especially in AI. Um, I'm a sex worker. I work as a dominatrix specifically, and I'm trying to move my business in the Web3 world um, and in our uh, collectives too, the way of organization of the DAOs. Um, nothing. Um, currently, I'm translating into Spanish, Intelligence and Spirit from Rosa Negarestani. Um, that's basically everything. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks. And uh, Eduarda? Um, oh, okay. Eduarda can't turn on their mic right now, so we'll um, we'll just move on for a second. And uh, uh, Rachel, if you'd like to go. Okay, um, Tao Fei. Hi everyone, I'm Tao. Um, I'm a cultural worker based in Vancouver, Canada on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Um, yeah, I currently work for an organization called 221A, um, which works with artists and designers to develop um, emergent social and ecological infrastructures. And so we've been looking at cultural use cases for blockchain technology for the past couple of years. Um, and so, yeah, I've been, been dipping into the DAO space um, for, I don't know, about the past year and a half. And so I'm excited to be a part of uh, this kind of seminar that's maybe a bit more, um, takes a more expansive rather than market-based view on the, the developments in the space. And prior to being here, I was a music festival producer in Montreal for many, many years. And so I'm particularly tethered to, you know, IRL spaces and, um, and you know, gathering and those dynamics that can't necessarily, hopefully won't necessarily be purely replicated in, um, in the metaverse, let's say. So yeah, I, 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 I respond particularly to the, the last section of your presentation, Ross, around, you know, maybe um, sort of building some counter narratives to the maybe like quite anti-human um, definition of, or the pure definition of the DAO and seeing how it can be more entangled and enmeshed in, you know, in fleshy human spaces. I'm personally not super, super digital first in my background and in my research interests and my work. So yeah, looking for the lumpier, messier aspects. That of, sounds great. Great. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Um, Igor, would you like to go? Uh, I can't hear you. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Hi, I'm Igor. I'm a visual artist based in Brazil. Um, my interest in this seminar is because um, my favorite track of Hall Herner's album platform is da DAO, but, but also because I am, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for some kind of new uh, tech area to delve in because I'm about to start my my master program in digital media, and I'm I'm not exactly what I'm I will, I will research there, but I I am thinking I'm leaning I'm leaning to DAO. So yeah, is this? Thank you. Great, thanks so much. And uh, the video. Cheers. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I'm, yeah, I'm Zenobio. I'm a designer and researcher based in, in Brazil. I'm currently working here at the, at, here at, at the new center. Um, and 
Yeah, I, I, I do research on speculative design. I currently trying to move into philosophy of design, but I, I, I lack some of philosophical training. So I, I'm trying to read as much as I can to, to feel this. And I guess I already made my question about the, the vacuum NFT cleaner, something like that. And yeah. Could you repeat it quickly? Because uh, I didn't get a chance to write it down. Yeah, it, it was on the vacuum cleaner NFT. If that, how, how, why would that be a DAO instead of a just a simple program? Yeah, great. And then I, I guess, uh, I think the only person who hasn't gone is Rachel um, and Eduardo, but I know Eduardo's microphone's not working. Rachel, are you are you here? Ah, Eduardo, if you'd like to go, yeah, please. Hi everyone. Um, sorry for being late. Um, I was on um, a meeting a related a work related meeting. I am a visual artist based in Brazil, São Paulo, and currently making a master's where I'm studying memetics through aesthetics and making an approximation. Of this, and I'm very interested in, see, in developing um, leftist critical perception or even use of a DAO. Uh, I have I heard a little bit of the episodes of the blockchain socialist, but it was a long time ago, and an interesting sort of possible use of automation for leftist politics and things of this sort. Awesome. Cheers. Thank you. Also, great picture. <laughs> Okay, I think that's, um, I, I don't think Rachel must have stepped away from their computer, but if you'd, uh, if you'd like to, we can kind of move on from the bios into the discussion, if you'd like. Yeah, let's go for it. So, um, oh. I'm pondering, I mean, just to, just to kick things off, um, pondering Zenobio's question uh, about why that, that speculative DAO idea would be a DAO, not a simple program. Um, I mean, yeah, it's a really good question. Not one that I necessarily have have a, a great or a kind of slam dunk answer to. Um, I mean, I suppose one angle to come at it from is this one that I, um, that I picked up on in my talk about the... I suppose this broader issue of the uh, the automation, the autonomy of a DAO in its pure conception, you know, what what use do humans actually have in that? Really, I mean, beyond beyond being uh, a the 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 um, the 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 cause or the force that sort of sets them going, um, and then being a kind of chattel, really, um, which is ultimately what it kind of boils down to in daemon um a sort of substrate through which it can pursue its activities uh, in that in that kind of uh, slightly darker sci-fi vision humans don't necessarily have much of a place in that in relation to the uh to what could just be a program as you say um so i guess that's one that's one angle on it um yeah i don't know has anyone else got any thoughts on that I would um, I would say that it's a really good question, and it's and it's related to a much larger discussion and perhaps objection that happens in like when people are talking about Web three and especially DAOs, and that's like, well, to use the word that we've used a lot is troubling the definitions of what decentralized and autonomous actually means, um, and. It's funny that that you see these arguments go for like flow past on the feed about let's take decentralization and you know leftists and when we talk about that in a political way, what we're talking about is like the distribution of power um, and whether it's like you know is it like a horizontal distribution of power, etc. Whereas from a technological point of view, people are talking about it be technology being distributed within the technological system that is like running the 
running the DAO or like, you know, Ethereum is decentralized in that it runs on multiple servers and that the, the, the database is held in common across um, all of the, the validators, essentially, all the nodes. And then also the, the question of autonomy um, is, is, a, is an organization autonomous in that it is, it is code? that is like executing like a smart con well you know is a the question is is a drinks machine an autonomous machine you know you put your coin in and then the smart contract runs and you get your can out the bottom <laughs> do you know what i mean um or does the autonomy within the, the, the does the dao or the autonomous part of a dao mean that it has autonomy or agency within the technological system in which it's operating meaning that like as a um because a DAO is essentially, in terms of a blockchain, it is no different from an, an individual. It has a wallet or a smart contract, or it has a wallet address, an identity, um, and then it can then you know transact on the network. Um, so I think both of those those things are interesting to think about. You know, like is it politically decentralized or is it technologically decentralized? And then the autonomy, the autonomy or the autonomous part of it is like, is it running by itself or is it, um, or does it just have agents or is it like a, an organization of individuals and smart contracts that have agency within the technological system? I would also push further and talk about Ralph Merkel and his opinion of DAOs um, because he thinks that blockchains are alive. He thinks that Bitcoin is a living machine. Um, and I know in the discussion that I had with Reza um, and Matt Dryhurst a couple of months ago, that um, Ross kindly put on as part of um, Impossible Objects, we were talking about this, this exact thing. But Ralph Merkel goes further and says that DAOs are also living entities on the blockchain. <laughs> um, so the blockchain is alive. And then within, within that sort of substrate or surface, you that the DAOs themselves are things that are alive and that perhaps smart contracts are also things that are living within this technological system. Um, but yeah, that's how I would respond to that. It's complicated <laughs> and, you know, it gets crazy really fast when you, when you start to pull on all of those threads. Mm. The, uh, <clears throat> just to add something there, the, the essay by, uh, uh, Jaya's essay that I referred to at one point uh, called Decentralization Autonomy Organization is very much worth reading for its, so it, it only really deals with or only has the, the sort of time to deal with decentralization, but its approach is to show these, these contradictory aspects of decentralization. Um, at the end, she says that she'd like to do the same, uh, no, so on the one hand, technological decentralization of the sort that yeah, we, we're, I guess, talking about with crypto in general. But then also, you know, the part that I quoted from was the idea of the, the you know, the post-financial Big Bang market being itself a force of decentralization, um, a damaging one, and, you know, decentralizing, uh, decentralizing force of its own. So she spends that essay dealing with these, these two, um, these two, I guess, senses of the word that pull against each other and uh, says at the end that she'd like to do the same with autonomy and organization, um, which hopefully we're going to have her speaking in the second half of the course to, to actually fill in that particular blank. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting thing to think through yourself. I mean, you know, I guess it in, in, in relation to this question of uh, subjects, human subjects involved with DAOs, there is the question of whose autonomy is it the autonomy of the uh of the the mechanism of the structure of the DAO, or is it the autonomy of the humans what is the autonomy aiming to 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 who is it aiming to benefit um and on the question of organization again you could think about it in terms of what is being organized or who is being organized um i mean in that connection there's a, there's a paper that we have on our um, syllabus that you might find interesting. I forget what it's, uh, what's it called again? It's by Cornelia Visman. I'll check in a second for the, uh, the actual title. Um, but yeah, this is, this is worth, let me, let me just quickly get it. It's called Cultural Techniques and Sovereignty. And yeah, very much in the sense of almost like she puts it 
she boils it down to the grammatical voice of technology. What it what is being acted on? Is it transitive? Is it intransitive? She introduced this interesting idea of the medium verb. Anyway, it's worth worth looking at. Yeah, in relation to this uh, to these these issues that we've been discussing. Wait, can I jump in really fast? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what was Zenobia's original question again? It was uh, why. So the the idea of the the NFT DAO that just buys NFTs at a certain price and holds them for ten years, why would that be a DAO and not a simple program? Okay, All right. I think I have a better question than the one that I was going to ask before. Could I? It's sort of related to this. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um. So reading Damon or Damon, and do you pronounce it Damon? I guess that's what you were saying. But, I think he pronounces it Damon, but he also makes the point that you can pronounce it as in Suarez, but you can, you have the you have the choice. So it's Damon, Damon. It's Damon in the audio book, so that's how. Oh, I is think it? Okay, it. okay, that's yeah. that's, <laughs> so, <laughs> that's the authority. I had this crazy experience reading it, where like at the beginning I was just like so repulsed, like I was so like disgusted by the entire by Sobel and by like Grog and by the whole thing. And over the course of the book, I became more and more like increasingly sympathetic to what the daemon was doing. I think that's probably intentional. That's sort of how it's framed. Um, yeah, yeah. But I mean, by, by the end, I definitely started to feel like, okay, wow, this like daemon, I think it has the right idea, but if anything, it's not going far enough. And like, I kind of wanted to ask like, you know, were y'all feeling that too? Were you like rooting for it? And like, in what ways were you rooting for it and why? Because like, I don't know, for me, this sort of connects back to my interest in cybernetics and specifically like Stafford Beer in um, designing freedom. He talks about like regulating versus proliferating variety. And like what's really exciting to me about like algocracy and like using like things like DAOs to help organize societies and politics is that it can provide like a more spontaneous way to like for societies to self-regulate instead of just proliferating into chaos. And like, in a way, it seems like that's sort of what the daemon was actually trying to do is to prevent human society from collapsing in on itself in a chaotic way and actually become like a benevolent parasite to help regulate it better. But like, I think there are all sorts of other ways where it still didn't do a good job with that. Stafford Beer talks about this idea of like shooting the cat. This is one way to create more proliferating variety. If like there's some source of chaos, instead of actually integrating it into your system and dealing with it in a new way if you just shoot it if you just get rid of it it creates a potential vector for more proliferation that's sort of a dialectic like being too rigid or being too loose creates the same problem um and i feel like a lot of what was wrong with that that the demon in that book the daemon is that like it was all based on sobel's plan it like wasn't actually really like an open system it was it was super super tight in a way that i think mm -hmm. It had to kill lots of people and do lots of really horrible stuff that like you know was that all really necessary like he was relying too much on his own like individual genius thing like what if it was more of like a general intellect thing what if it was something yeah, where like, yeah. more people yeah. were contributing and like because of that the regulation was actually a lot stronger right like he seems like he made it fragile by relying too much on himself i mean there's a great seed for a, uh, you know, I want to also make sure that we always try and bring this back to the, I guess, the design focus of this course. But, you know, what you just said sounds like the great seed for a for a pitch idea. So that sense of, yeah, not, not uh, you know, having something on this kind of scale, but rooting it in general intellect as opposed to a single intellect with a, a single uh, ideological prejudice and technical ability and I guess yeah sort of conception that it wants the um the the system to play out especially in the second have you read the second book as well have you did you read yeah def definitely worth having a look at that because there's there's a there's a real change in tone I mean I think he he speaks in interviews about how they were originally one book but he had to split them in two because no one was really that interested in the content of the second one the second one's much more in a kind of utopia mode as in like Thomas More's Utopia, where he, he really wants you to be taken on a tour around the kind of society that the daemon is creating. Uh, it's much more kind of sober, less le somewhat less action-filled version of it. But, wow. 
he de- well, yeah, it's, yeah, somewhat, yeah, it's a relative term, I suppose. But, but he definitely wants you to, like you were saying, I think he does want you to get on board with, with what the daemon is doing in, in many ways, or a little bit more so even than, than the first book. But yeah, sorry, no, just I, I maybe took it slightly away from the content of what you were saying just then. But um, yeah, I, I know I definitely had that sense of, of, of almost in a slightly kind of like disgusted way, still slightly getting on board, on board with the, the plan unfolding um, of what the, the day one was trying to accomplish. I think the book's interesting in that way because um, there's only a couple of other sci-fi novels that I can think of where you you essentially end up rooting for the for the AI character or the AI figure. Um, mm. One of them being like um, Anne Leckie's Ancillary Justice trilogy, which mm. or quad, quadrilogy. I can't remember how many books there are, um, but that's an interesting book in itself because you don't really want to root for the for the AI. Um, just from the way it like weaponizes religion, but I'm not going to say anymore if you haven't read the, the trilogy. Um, and also there's a book called um, uh, a very, very old 1950s kind of golden age of sci-fi book called Gateway, um, which is the first um, sci-fi novel that has a AI psychotherapist called mm-hmm. Siegfried. And um, that novel also is, is like, has this... It, that the whole novel is is told through the through the lens of like the each chapter opens at the beginning of a therapy session and then it sort of slides into narrating what happened and it's it's really and I think it was like the late fifties that that book was written and it's that's really interesting as well um, for just the relationship as a reader that you have with with an AI character but to answer your question it's I can't believe that that book was written in two thousand six um, I think that there are other antecedents, but like he nailed so much about the world in which we live in, in 2022. Um, and I know Matt, and I know Holly Herndon says the same thing in her interview with Daniel Suarez on, um, interdependence, um, their podcast about just about like the, the projections, the assumptions that he made, and then the, the narrative, you know, like the, the, the narrative hook that he had around the idea of the daemon, um, I think was, it's just, re- it's, it's just a very good way of exploring the world in which he creates, you know, um, uh, and it, yeah, and here we are in 2022 talking about it. I mm. also think it's interesting, just as an aside, that um, Vitalik's inspiration for creating Ethereum comes from playing world of warcraft and the fact that uh one of the um his favorite spell for his character for his warlock character was nerfed as part of like a rebalancing of the of the um the meta in the game and it made him so angry that he cried and then the next day as a teenager went and create like invented a whatever it is a two trillion dollar cryptocurrency ecosystem <laughs> <laughs> and that and that and that kind of inspiration uh, persists in the. I mean, the idea of the soulbound token is the same thing, right? So it's mm-hmm. kind of again derived from that kind of gaming culture, which is why Key's essay is, is so good about the prehistory of DAOs, rather mm. than going through like the the cybernetic history of mm. you know technological systems for organizing. She goes through the gaming history. Um, yeah. Is, yeah. which um it's on the it's on the syllabus and i'm sure she'll yeah talk it's about on it. for it's on for week three yeah it's one of the yeah. required texts yeah but yeah definitely something to read straight away if you uh if you haven't already i mean just to just to actually jump off that point you were making about the um kind of uncanny predictive aspect of daemon for our world today i mean i i would definitely put some of that down to and i'm mentioning this in relation to how you might be uh creating your own distinct futures for your DAOs to operate. But I, I'd say that a lot of that, or something I definitely feel when I read Daemon and Freedom TM, is the fact that Suarez, very, in a very disciplined manner, limits himself to already existing technologies that can be used in exactly the ways that he describes. And I think that this this talent he has for for knitting together these plausible these plausible moments is very much what creates that kind of that feeling we have of the, like wow yeah he did he did very much predict what we have now because 
um, there's 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 less of an element of I'm not saying that the element of fantasy is is unwelcome, of course, um, because I think that actually that could be a great path to uh, developing some quite wild DAO ideas. But that's definitely one of the sources of the force of that particular fiction, I think. Whereas William Gibson's Idaru series, which was written around the same time, um, is it called the Idaru? Is it the Idaru trilogy? I can't remember what the, the three books know, are. It's like it, Burning but... Chrome and anyway, yeah, yeah. like they were all written about in the early 2000s as well. And, and if you reread them now, which I did a couple of years ago, they, they feel like a, a messy retro future from the early 2000s rather than a, than a very plausible now that you get when you're reading day. Hmm. Um, I can't remember who, who mentioned a question earlier, um, but I made a note of it. One of the things I wanted to just quickly touch on is databases and just the, the idea of the blockchain in itself. I think one of the, one of the things that, that largely gets lost in discussions around blockchain technology is the prob is the, is the computer science problem that it's solved and what that means and, and what that means for the way in which we think about what's possible using the technology. Um, essentially, the blockchain allow, has solved the problem of a massively distributed database, global, global database, because up until the invention of the blockchain, it, that was a problem that was largely disregarded by computer science as being a hard problem, extremely hard problem. And the reason why it's a hard problem is because of the, literally the speed of light. So if you have 10,000 transactions happening in Tokyo and they're going to go the long way around the world to Brazil, that, that, that whatever it is, you know, like the, the 0.8 second, the 0.8 of a second that it takes to get those transaction, that information from one database to another means that, the, that you're never, you're always out of date. Wherever you are in the world, the database is out of date. And the way that the, the, the introduction, the, the introduction of a clock into a database um, is essentially the, the, the significant computer science um, problem. Um, and that, that, we, that all of the transactions happen, everyone's looking, and then at the end of the time, those transactions are confirmed across different nodes in the network. And then we have a canon canonical uh, block of truth as, as seen by all of the different nodes in the network that they all agree on. Because obviously, if you're in Paris and you've got a, a node in Paris, a node in um, Sydney, and a node in New York, all of the transactions that happen in those three or four seconds that happen in a block in, within the blockchain period come in out of order, in different orders, whether where, where, where you are on the, on the globe. Um, but those transactions were witnessed by nodes in the network, and then they and then they are like committed to the block to memory, um, and the and the the, the second significant um, advancement in computer science is the way in which that database is secured. So that we trust Google, or we trust Facebook, or we trust the bank because they house their computers in massive data centers behind barbed wire. <laughs> and they and and they have reputational risk if they screw with the database, whether that's editing it ex post facto or manipulating transactions or so on and so forth. And the way that that is, um, and that and this is where the, the notion of trust comes in in kind of like the Web three or, or blockchain terms is: can you trust a database? Because we all live in a date, we live in a database society. There's I mean, I would estimate that if you've got 100 apps on your phone, I would estimate you've got 300 SQL, separate SQL databases just on your phone held within the apps, let alone the way it gets abstracted into multidimensional, five-dimensional databases in, in the cloud. Um, and, the, and the way that we trust the blockchain originally through Bitcoin is through the process of proof of work that we, we have these servers that are, that spend 1% of their computational power looking through the pinhole at what transactions are happening and then they spend 99% of the rest of the their computational power doing maths <laughs> essentially like solving maths puzzles um, and 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 because the software is signed and secured we know that if this server let's call them is capable of 
um, solving these puzzles and interacting with the network, we can trust, or we don't, we, we, we can trust in an abstract sense, we can trust the fact that what they're seeing coming through the, the pinhole of the transactions is what is, is what is occurring. Um, and yeah, that's a sense. I hope that's a very, that's, it's taken me 10 years to explain, to, to explain blockchains in, in three, four minutes like that, but hopefully everyone's on the, on the same page in, in, in how they work. And then we have proof of stake as well, but that's like a, a newer innovation. Hmm. Hearing you talk about this. Um, so the, first of all, it makes me think of another book recommendation. Again, it's on our syllabus. Um, but I think if I remember correctly, there's quite a good summary or similar kind of explanation to what you were just saying, Jay, in Ignota's white, the white paper, which is the, uh, the um uh, i helped edit that book the, right, right. Jaya, yeah I, yeah so i think i think jaya's just am i right the she wrote the, commentary, she so wrote the commentary. some of the same yeah. some of the same stuff you were just talking about yeah so yeah um uh and then the other thing was i mean again partly thinking about this from the design perspective um it occurs to me that we we're talking about Web three as the the media, um, or let's say if we don't call it Web three, the the you know the de decentralized web of today as being the the media in which this DAO experimentation emerges, um, and it would probably be quite easy for us to fall into the trap of thinking that that will somehow be the same in fifteen years time. I mean, it seems like a stupid thing to say, but we're talking about this almost as if it could be a constant and simply elaborated. You know the the promises of things that are there today being elaborated whereas actually of course you know web3 if it's if it's a thing was preceded by web2 and the put them the the axis of distinction between the two or one of them being this question of centralization versus decentralization i guess one can predict that subsequent iterations of um you know web4 web5 etc um will probably swing backwards and forwards or have their own reckoning with this question of decentralization and recentralization. I mean, I suppose one question I, I asked myself, and maybe I'll ask you this, uh, Jay, is why hasn't this, why hasn't the experimentation that we've seen in the crypto sphere, and particularly within DAOs, why didn't it happen with Web2? I, my answer to that is that the, 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 communities involved in free and open source software failed utterly <laughs> in um, in communicating what it was and what it is that they are both building and in charge of. Um, for example, Richard Stallman, and for all of his faults, Richard Stallman saw the future that we live in coming in 1983, 1982, when he was working, when he was an undergraduate working with IBM mainframes that were as large as a room. He saw, he, he saw the need that code needs to be, well, well the, the four freedoms is freedom zero, which is to be able to run code and then be able to see code, to modify code and distribute code. Um, and what happened was there's a, there's a really fantastic documentary and I actually have a essay that I'm writing at the moment called web three is being built in public, which is, which will go into this, but there's a fantastic documentary about the history of, about the shift from the free software foundation to the term open source about this marketing ideological sleight of hand that happened because free and open source or free software, free, like the free software foundation, the G, the G, the GNU license, the GPL license, which web three is, entirely licensed under is the most radical attack on intellectual property rights conceived since the invention of intellectual property rights like and the affero license which is which is another license goes further which is anyone can see the code anyone if you edit the code you have to publish the code and if you don't you'll get sued into oblivion and what happened is is that linux was created all of this gnu code was um, gnu code was written and the value that it created was captured by Google, Facebook, um, and all of the, the stacks that we associate with the web today, right? Like the web is not possible without, without GPL licensed code, in like the LAMP stack on servers and so on and so forth. And, but all of the, the value that was created by this free and open source software was captured by 
centralized organizations. The significant thing about Web3 is that Bitcoin is based on the, the, it's the, it's the GPL license. It's not MIT, it's like, it is the GPL license. And much of Ethereum is a Faro license. And there's, there's a whole reckoning that's coming in the next couple of, next couple of years about like centralized organizations using a Faro license code and they're not publishing their changes to it for sure. And there's a lot of money in this space as well. So that will be interesting. But where I'm going with this is that the, the significant thing is that, that, that before Satoshi released the Bitcoin code, open source software had no way of generating value of its own. Whereas Bitcoin has this integrated value generation mechanism inside it, and it's created an enormous amount of wealth for individuals, but also from open code. It's, a, it's, it's actually extraordinary what's happened in the last, in the last 12 years. Hmm. Yeah. And I guess a question for all of you. I mean, to think Do about. Do you agree with that? <laughs> Do you agree, you with, agree that with that? Analysis? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like. Also, it's... yeah. Where is this all going? What's Web 4? What, what's Web 5, Web 6, et cetera, going to be? What's, what are the steps that are going to take you to the future that you imagine for 2035? So that might be a, actually a great place to um, maybe wrap up for today. I don't know, how do you guys feel? Do you have any last uh, last notes that you'd like to be on the recording or? No? We can carry this on in, in the Discord if uh, anyone's got anything um, they feel they still have, you know, they still want to bring up. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry, the classes are always seen quite long in the beginning and then sh way too short at the end. So <laughs> totally. Um, so thank you everybody today. Uh, we'll be sending out an email with all the information. Um, I'm gonna just stop the recording now, but feel free to stick around. Okay.